Kia ora. In this video I'm going to give you instructions on how to build your own Arduino button box for flight sims, space sims, racing sims, whatever you might want a button box for. There are already a bunch of other button box videos online but they're usually pretty inflexible like they'll give instructions on how to build a particular box with a bunch of switches and buttons and rotaries but they'll all have to be laid out in a very precise and exact format if you want that button box to work. What I'm hoping to explain in this video is how to design, build and code your own original button box to your own specifications. You shouldn't need to know anything about coding or electronics to follow this video as much as possible. I'm going to keep it simple enough for a complete beginner. Okay, so first let's look at what components you can use. For this video we're going to explain how to use momentary switches, rotary encoders and potentiometers. So what are all of those? First momentary switches, these are switches which flick on and then off again automatically. Like for this switch, it's a momentary switch, you can see it flicks on and then it flicks back off automatically as soon as I release my finger. This button is also a kind of momentary switch because after I stop pressing it, it clicks back into the off position. You could also use a toggle switch like this one, which you can see it locks into the on position, but personally I find these a little bit annoying to deal with. Second we have rotary encoders. These work by sending out digital pulses, so each click in one direction counts as one button press, and every click in the other direction counts as a different button press. Rotary encoders come in a wide variety of types, I'd recommend one like this which has lots of clicks and it can be turned indefinitely. Finally we have potentiometers. A potentiometer is basically like a dimmer switch on a light. It can be turned smoothly through 360 degrees. You can also get versions that slide up and down like a fader on a mixing desk. So what should you get? Well it depends totally on what you want your button box to do but I'll give you a couple of tips. In most cases I'd recommend using a momentary switch or button rather than a toggle switch. That's because a toggle will hold the button down so if you want to push that button twice you'll need to flick the switch or push the button twice which is usually just a waste of time. Second tip, if you want some kind of rotary input I'd usually recommend a rotary encoder rather than a potentiometer. Potentiometers have a limited range of motion, they're like an axis on a joystick, whereas most rotary encoders can be turned indefinitely in either direction, and that means they have a greater range of uses because each click in either direction counts as a button press, and they often have an additional push button function, so effectively you get three buttons on a single component. They're also a little bit better for fine adjustments, so for example if you want one for tuning a radio, you know always that one little click is going to mean one number up on tuning your radio. Now that said, there are some reasons you might prefer a potentiometer, for example if you want a really smooth action for an axis, so like if you're building a replica throttle or a replica trim wheel for a flight sim, or maybe you're designing a steering wheel for a racing sim, for those you'd probably prefer to use a potentiometer. Also one little trick with rotary encoders is that if you spin them too fast they sometimes won't register all of the clicks that they're being turned through. So if you want something that you can turn really quickly to get to a certain position then you probably want a potentiometer instead. There are ways to get around that with a rotary encoder but you need to do a bit more work on the electronic side. You need to create something called a debounce circuit. Um, if you want to do that um, just look it up online. Look up debounce rotary encoder and there's tons of resources out there. Okay so the next step is to design your button box. Now I'd recommend just spend a bit of time with a pencil and paper just scribbling down different ideas of how you want your button box to work. Think about what kinds of switches or rotaries or other components you might want to link to different functions in your sim. Um, think about how you want to lay them out in your box. Um, it's a good idea to do a final mock-up in free 3D modeling software like SketchUp because that'll give you a better feel for the ergonomics of your box. So in my case I wanted one that would work for IL2 and DCS. I already have a Warthog HOTAS which comes with a bunch of different switches so I, I don't need any more of those toggle switches. What I really want is some rotary knobs to control things like um, radiator inlets, radar antenna, trim, 
um, plus a bunch of momentary buttons for things like weapon selection, lights, stuff like that. Um, I also want it to be sort of three-dimensional, so I want some of the buttons on the top and, and a couple of the rotary end functions on the front, but I also want some on the side so that, like this one for example, I want to use this one for my elevator trim, so when I turn it this way, um, my trim makes me nose heavy, and I turn it this way and my elevator trim goes um, nose light. But look, you don't, want, you don't have to build it this way, if you just want to make it on one big flat panel, that's totally fine. Okay, so that's the design stage done. Now we need to work out how we're going to wire up all our components to our Arduino. So I'm going to use the Arduino Leonardo as an example, but these same principles could equally be applied to a different kind of board, like an Uno or a Pro Micro. Now if you look at an Arduino, you'll see a bunch of holes around the sides. These are called pins. Some of them you'll see they have numbers. These are digital pins, which can be used to receive digital signals. Some of them will have A and then a number beside them. These are analog pins, which can be used for digital or analog signals, and we'll come back to that in just a second. Um, there are also a few other kinds of pins, but for the purposes of a button box, you can ignore all of them aside from the ground pin and the 5 volt output pin. Okay, so now let's look at how to connect our components to these pins. Okay, so for a normal momentary button or switch, there will be two terminals. You need to wire each terminal to a different pin to complete the circuit. For most rotary encoders, you will have five terminals. Two of them will control the push button function, and they just work like any other button. You hook them up to two separate pins. These other three are for the rotary functions. The middle one gets hooked up to ground, and these other two control the twist function, and they both each get linked to a digital pin. Now you can also get rotary encoders which look like this, um, but these have helpful labels which tell you what each terminal is for. Potentiometers have three terminals. The left and right ones are connected to the 5 volt output and to the ground. Now the center terminal measures how far the dial is being turned. Now this terminal will send out an analog signal, so you have to hook it up to one of the analog pins. It won't work if you connect it to a digital pin. Okay, so now let's set up our wiring system. I recommend using some drawing software like GIMP or Photoshop. Um, you need something which lets you draw in multiple layers, because by the time we've finished our diagram, it is going to look like this. So it's going to help you a lot if you can just show the layers for the wires you are interested in and just hide everything else. But honestly, if you just wanted to use a few sheets of paper and some colored pencils, that would also work perfectly fine. So our first layer is going to have the Arduino board, plus a simplified layout of our components based on that 3D mock-up I drew earlier. So these here are the buttons, um, these are our encoders, and these are our potentiometers. So now we start drawing all the wires which connect our switches and rotaries and potentiometers to our different pins. Um, make sure you use a different layer for each wire and that you label them clearly and use a different color for each wire because that is going to make your life so much easier when you have to use this diagram to actually physically go and connect up all your different components. And now we've run into a problem. We haven't got enough pins to fit all our components. So you'll notice every rotary encoder has a total of five pins, every button has two pins, and every potentiometer needs three pins. So that's, in total with all of these components, that's way too many terminals for the number of pins we have on this board. So what do we do? Well, first we can save ourselves a lot of pins by using the same ground pin to connect to all our potentiometers and rotary encoders. We just connect all those wires together, then run them to the same pin. And we can do the same for the 5 volt pin to our potentiometers. Now our potentiometers only use one pin for each output, that's not a big deal. We can just hook those up directly. Remember they need to go to an analog pin, so for this example we'll use pins A4 and A5. 
But for our buttons and encoders, we still have way more terminals than we have the pins to connect them to. And we can't just link them up in a big loop like we did with the ground wire and the five volt. Um, instead, we need to create something called a button matrix. Um, basically, this is how every keyboard or like a keypad on an alarm system works. Um, what you do is you create a grid. So every button is going to have one terminal connected to a horizontal row in the grid and the other terminal is going to be connected to a vertical column. So for our example we are going to make a matrix which has three rows of buttons and four columns. Um, so this lets us include all our momentary buttons and the push button function for all five of our rotary encoders. And you'll notice there's just one button missing here. I just didn't need an extra button there, so I'm leaving it out of this matrix. So this saves us a huge number of pins on the Arduino because we only need one pin for each column and each row. So for our example, our rows are going to be connected to pins 13, 12 and 11, while our columns are connected to pins A0, A1, A2 and A3. So just to explain a bit more about how this works, like when we push this button, the Arduino is going to get a signal that says, oh, one of the four buttons connected to pin 13 has been pressed. Then it's going to get another signal that says, oh, one of the three buttons on pin A3 has been pressed. And then it's going to ask itself, well, which button is connected to both A3 and 13? And, well, the only one is this button here. So it's going to go, ah, well, this button must be pushed. So just a quick warning note, this matrix will run into problems if you try to push a lot of buttons at the same time. So like more than two or three buttons, if you hold them down at the same time, um, your box will probably end up telling you that a whole lot of other buttons that you're not pressing are also being pushed. Um, this is something called ghosting, and you can get around it by, some, by wiring some blocking diodes into the matrix. So if you want to do that, if you want to push a whole lot of buttons at once in your button box, just Google keypad ghosting, and you'll find plenty of information about how to stop that. But for my button box, I'm only ever going to push one button at a time, so I'm just not going to worry about it. Okay, so that's our buttons and potentiometers dealt with. The last step is the two terminals on each rotary encoder, um, which sends the signals for the twist function. Now, unfortunately, I can't include these in my button matrix, so I'm just going to wire each of them directly to the Arduino, but luckily I now have enough space to connect them all. Now there are a couple of important things to remember when wiring rotary encoders just using the, the code that we're going to show you later on. First, with the code we're using, they must be connected to the lowest numbered pins in sequence. So you have to wire the first encoder to pin 0 and to pin 1, the second one needs to be to pin 2 and pin 3, and so on. Second, they need to be connected in pairs. So if you tried to connect the first encoder to pins 0 and 2 and the second one to pins 1 and 3, it won't work. I really recommend getting some colored wires and using a different color of wire to connect each rotary encoder. Um, just, make, just so that you don't accidentally mix them up when you're trying to connect them. Okay, so now you have a plan, you can go and actually buy the stuff you need to make this thing. Um, obviously, you'll need your buttons and your encoders and your Arduino. Um, you also need some wire. I recommend getting a pack of multicolored wire like this so that you can match the color of the wire in your wiring diagram to the actual physical wires that you're connecting. It just makes things much less confusing when you're actually doing this. Um, if you're using an Arduino Leonardo or an Arduino Uno, you will also need some jumper cables like these which plug into the pins. Again, get a bunch of different colors to match your wiring diagram. 
You'll also need an enclosure and just make sure it's big enough because for my project I ended up wiring up everything and then discovered that my box was way too small to fit in all of my components and wires so I had to tear the whole thing apart and start from scratch. Um, you'll also need some solder. Um, for a project like this you want quite fine solder like this. You'll also need a soldering iron. You don't need anything expensive. This one cost 15 New Zealand dollars and it's powered by a USB port and it worked perfectly fine. Also, you might want to buy a pair of wire strippers. Um, I actually just used a pair of nail clippers to save myself a few bucks and that mostly worked okay. Um, you could also get a, what are, one of these things, which is called helping hands with a magnifying glass. Not essential, it might make life a little bit easier. At the very least, do make sure you have a pair of vice grips or pliers to hold your components still while you're soldering them. Okay, so the next step is to build your button box. Um, this is going to be different for every project, so I'm not going to walk you through each step. Basically, you just need to connect all your components up the same way you have mapped out in your wiring diagram. Um, I will give a few tips. When it comes to soldering, it's worth watching a few videos on technique and practicing with some bits of spare wire before you actually start work on your project, just to make sure you really feel confident, you feel like you know what you're doing. Um, when you're connecting up your button matrix, only use the shortest length of wire you need to to get from one component to the next. Because if you don't, your box will end up as a horrific, confusing tangle of wire like mine did on my first attempt. And that means that if something breaks, it becomes really hard to find what's broken and then to, you know, fiddle in your soldering iron and your solder to solder it back together again. On a similar note, um, Usually quite helpful to use a bit of electrical tape or blue tack just to keep things organized. So for example, like I tape together all my row wires um, separately from my column wires um, and then I taped up my potentiometer wires and my rotary encoding wires. Um, that just meant that when I was ready to plug those wires into my Arduino, it was much easier to figure out which wire belonged to which pin. Also just don't get too frustrated if everything goes wrong. Like personally, I had to start from scratch three times before I got my button box working. You just gotta to stick to it and eventually, I promise, you'll figure it out. Okay, so your button box is all wired up and now you are ready to start coding. Now for this, you will need to download the Arduino IDE software. So get that installed, I've included a link below. Then you need to download the keypad and joystick libraries. Um, there are links to both of those in the description. Copy and paste those libraries into the directory. And then open IDE. Oh, before I forget, credit to AM Studio for a lot of this code. Um, all I've really done is modify his work to make it um, a bit easier to follow and also to make potentiometers work with it. So check out his videos, give them a like, um, and definitely check out his other videos because he has lots of instructional videos on how to make button boxes and all sorts of awesome things. So now we've wired everything up, we've built our button box, and now we are ready to start coding. Um, the code which we're looking at here, you can find in the description of this video. Um, all you need to do is just download it and copy and paste it into a new project here. So let's see what we're looking at. Um, look, I know this all looks very complicated and I'm not gonna ask you to actually understand any of it. I don't understand a bit of it myself. Um, I had to get help from my partner who's a proper software developer to make it all work. I'm only just going to explain what you need to change to make your own button box work. Okay, so first it starts pretty simple. We just need to tell our computer what to expect from our button box, what functions we expect it to have. So first of all, how many rotaries do we have? Well, we can go back to our circuit diagram and check. So we have one, two, three, four, five rotary encoders. So we go back here change this to five. 
Next, number of buttons. How many buttons do we have? Again, go back here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, and we also have the push button functions on each of these, so that's seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Go back to our code, change this to 11. The next two, we need to know how many, num how many um, rows and columns we have in our button matrix. So again, go back to the diagram. We have one, two, three rows, one, two, three, four columns. Come back here, we have three rows, four columns. Cool, so now we move on to the bit of the code which deals with the button matrix. So if you look here, this is basically sort of like, imagine this is a layout of our button matrix. It has rows and it has columns. So the first thing we need to do is change this to match um, what our matrix looks like. So you'll see here that there are four rows and four columns. Now, if we had say like a five by five matrix, so this is a four by four matrix, if we had a five by five matrix, we just have to change this. So we had one extra number here and to add to, so to add up to having five columns. So let me go there. We go there and we need one extra row. And you'll notice here we have one comma behind, beside each line of code, except for the last one. That's important. You just got to make sure that it always looks like that. There's always one comma beside each line of code, except for the last one in this part. But we don't have a five by five matrix. We have a three by four matrix. So we need only three rows and four columns. So we can just get rid of this, get rid of this, and remember here, get rid of this last comma. The next step here is to change all of these question marks into a number, and we start from zero. So we go zero, one, two, three. Cool, so there we go. We have our button matrix all set up, good to go. The next bit we have to deal with is our rotary encoders. Um, so basically what we've got here is each line of code here refers to a different encoder. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. Um, so the first two numbers refer to which pin the rotary encoder is connected to. So you remember each rotary encoder has two pins controlling the twist function and this is telling us which two pins are controlling those things. So we go, again, we go back to our code here. Um, this is why we're using layers here, so we can make it easy to spot what's what. We have a look in here, and we can see our first encoder is connected to pins zero and one. So again, we come back here and look at our code, zero and one, and we have to, with this code, we have to start with zero and one. The next two numbers are telling us which buttons will be pressed when we turn in each direction. So if I just bring up my, um, my game controller um, properties here, you can see that if I'm twisting one of my potentiometers, uh, one of my rotary encoders, it's pushing a button for every little click that it goes through. And this is telling it which button to press. Now it's not exact because we start again we start counting from zero so we only go up to 32 um, but 31 because we start counting from zero um, and by the way you cannot have more than 32 buttons um, on a joystick controller you'll see here it only goes up to 32 so that means that you cannot exceed 31 as your final rotary encoder button um, so just make sure you don't do that um, so say if we had one more rotary encoder, say in your project you want six rotary encoders, um, then you would copy this here, put it below, whoops, put it below, um, and then we would check which pins we were connected to. So let's just pretend we had another one that was connected to pins 10 and 11. So we come in here, we say 10 and 11. And if we did want to do this, we would have to leave this at 30 and 31, and we'd have to change this back, so this one would become um, 29, 28, 27, 26, and so on. Um, but we're not going to do that, we only have five rotary encoders, and again, if you had less than five, you just delete a line of code here, 
and then you'd delete the comma here. So you're all done. Cool, next step, moving along. Cool, so this is the second part of the button matrix. We need to tell it which pins our rows are connected to and which pins our columns are connected to. So we do that by going again back to our schematic here. Um, we show our button matrix wires and we can check and we can see here that our rows are connected to pins 13, 12 and 11 while our columns are connected to A0, A1, A2, A3 and we'd come through here and change those. So I've already done this so it's 13, 12, 11, A0, A1, A2, A3 but obviously you can have your project connected to different um, to different things. For example, maybe you had an extra row, maybe you had another row that's connected to, um, to pin 10, so you just add in 10 there. Cool. Um, the next step is our joystick settings. So this is telling our computer how many um, different functions our joystick has. So the first function is the number of buttons. We've set that to 32, which again is the most number of buttons that you can have. You can set this lower if you want to. Personally, I don't see any, there's no particular problem just putting it on 32. You can just have buttons that, buttons in, um, in this grid here that you would never be able to press, but that doesn't really matter. Then you have hat switches. Um, I'm not going to explain how to do hat switches in this video because to be honest, I don't know. Um, I imagine it's relatively straightforward. Um, the next step here has to do with our potentiometers. So these are all the different axes which our button box can have. Um, you'll see there's quite a lot of them. Um, if I just open up, um, I've got a, I've got my hotel, my um, warthog connected here, or actually I'll do my joystick. So if I open this up, you'll see that there's a few different axes here. Like I've got this little slider. Um, this is an axis, my joystick axis. And then I've got a rotation, which is the um, rudder function here. Um, and you can do the same thing for your Arduino, for your button box. Um, so for mine, I have two potentiometers. Um, just by the way, these first two, the y-axis and the x-axis, um, they control, if I go back here for half a second, they control this thing here, so that you can see it's x and y-axis, so x across, y up and down. Um, and then you also have these um, just two-dimensional ones which just go across um, and those are all of the rest of the different um, axes that you can have in this code here. So I'm not going to use the x and y axis because I've just got some knobs and I don't want them to um, to control something in, a, as in sort of like a pointer in a box. Um, I just want them to go left and right. So instead I'm going to use the z and rx axes for my two potentiometers. So I just change each of these to true to tell them that those axes are there. Um, you can set as many of these as you want to true um, but it'll only pick up the ones that have got potentiometers connected to them. Cool, so we come down to the next potentiometer, next part of the potentiometer code. Um, actually for this purpose let's pretend I have a third potentiometer. I don't really but I'm going to pretend I do for the purpose of this example. So I'm going to pretend I have a third potentiometer and I want to bind it to the RX axis, uh, to the RY axis. So if you come down here to part one, um, you'll see that we've already got the Z axis set up, the RX axis set up. So all we need to do for our imaginary third potentiometer is add the, is copy and paste this, but change it to RY axis. That's us done there. Next step here, is we need to tell our code which pins our potentiometers are connected to. So we'll go back to our diagram here again. We will show our potentiometer cables, hide everything else, and we'll see here that our potentiometers are connected to pins A5 and A4, and we'll pretend our imaginary potentiometer is connected to pin A3. So come back to our code, we'll see here, potentiometer pin 1 is A4, potentiometer pin 2 is A5, 
and let's pretend we have our third potentiometer so we'll copy and paste this here potentiometer pin 3 need to change this of course you could have a 4, 5, 6, 7 and then we'll tell it which pin that imaginary third potentiometer is connected to and it is going to be connected to pin A3. Cool, that's that done. So we scroll down a little bit further here. Um, this, I'm not going to explain what all this stuff does, but basically again it's just copying and pasting this and changing it to match what you have from above. So I'm going to copy and paste this here. Um, so I go through and change everything to match what I have above. So I know that this is our third potentiometer, so it's potentiometer pin 3, which you remember from earlier here, potentiometer pin 3, and, it's, and it is connected to the RY axis. So we just need to go through here and change everything to RY axis. Cool. And that's literally it. So it's, it's really just a little bit of copying and pasting and changing things around to match whatever is in your circuit diagram here. The final step that you have to take is to um, export this code. But first um, I'll just show you this last function which is verify. So this is just a check that your code doesn't have any obvious problems with it. So you click this and it goes compiling sketch takes a little while sometimes, done compiling, no problems. But say I had forgotten to take off this um, semicolon here. Then I would verify, and oh, it spotted a problem. It's expecting something before current output level, and what it's expecting is a semicolon. So that's just to help you a little bit um, find stuff that's, that's gone wrong. Um, you can, if you like the, the best way to figure out what you've done wrong if something happens is to just go back and compare your code to the original code that's in the description to the video and just make sure there's not little things missing like make sure that for example you might have forgotten to change this from rx to ry or something a little like that um, it won't always pick it up if you do the verify thing that something's wrong um, so you do just have to hunt through and figure out what's wrong the final step is to actually upload this code to your button box. So to do that you plug in your button box um, to the USB port, you go to tools, you check which board you have, so I have an Arduino Leonardo so I click that, you check which port it is connected to and it should tell you, so here it says COM14 Arduino Leonardo so I click that one, um, and then you click upload. And from there, your button box should be working. The final step that you have to take is go ahead and test it. So you open up your game controllers, um, click on it, hit properties, fiddle with your knobs, push all the buttons. Um, the final thing you have to do is calibrate. Like say, if this was uploaded for the first time, it might be, yeah, you can see here, actually I haven't calibrated this properly. So that's not moving smoothly, and this one, um, this one's moving properly. But what you gotta do is go to calibrate. So you hit next, next, and then move your things all the way up and down. Don't worry about what it looks like. And this little thing here, it is working. Then you go next. Do your next potentiometer, turn it up and down, next, finish, and we see there these are working perfectly. And finally before you finish make sure you check each one of your buttons, make sure that all of them are working, um, make sure that when your rotary encoders are turning that they're being picked up, because you may need to go in and um, fix some loose connections and things like that. Um, I definitely had to do that a few times before I got this working. Um, and it helps actually when you have this code in here because it'll tell you which buttons aren't working and that makes it a lot simpler to find where you've soldered something wrong. So yeah, I hope that was really helpful. I hope you can get your own button box working. Um, yeah, cheers. Bye now.